I was just wondering, why would it be necessary for the Apostle Paul to be so concerned about the false gospel or another gospel? And I realized that when you look at the kingdom of God, the gospel is a vehicle through which the kingdom is introduced, established, and extended. The gospel is the means through which the kingdom of God is introduced into the lives of people. It is the means through which the kingdom is established and is the means through which the kingdom is propagated. And I began to realize that any clever schemer that wants to frustrate the establishment, or rather the introduction, the establishment, and the propagation of the kingdom, all they need to do is interfere with the means. Now, the reason why I would spend so much time teaching things that really don't have what you would call or maybe identify as immediate personal benefit to a member, especially as far as your current needs are concerned, is that there are certain basic things and as a leader of the Church of Jesus Christ, if you look at the spirit that the Apostle Paul is writing with, you would appreciate this is a man that really has a special concern and attachment to the church of Jesus Christ. When you look at the words that he uses in first, Second Corinthians 11, especially verse 2, he says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealous. This is a man of God who really loves the church, and he is concerned about what would happen to the church of Jesus Christ. And he says, I betrothed you to one husband. In other words, he's saying, I have been the mediating factor between you, the bride, and also you and the groom, that is Jesus Christ. And he says that I want to present to you, to him, as a chaste virgin. You can see the determination, the love and the concern that the apostle has about the spiritual state of the church. You know, it is something that is rare, you know, even to find from many of us as ministers. It's difficult to hear a minister, you know, saying things like this, you know, really concerned about the spiritual state and the welfare of the church. And then he says, but I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And he's so concerned that, you know, these people that he really brought to Christ, he, you know, founded, he grounded, they could easily be turned away from the faith. And I was just challenged, you know, to see the heart of the Apostle Paul as, you know, as far as the welfare and the spiritual well-being of the church is concerned. I remember we say that, uh, you know, this false gospel is so serious that even today, Christians are living in constant danger of receiving another gospel. And if you're careful and listen, you realize that really the church is, is permeated. I was just reading this morning, I just opened my, my phone and I was reading, some, somebody wrote something about the millennials. And there's something happening to the young people. Because he was saying that many, many young people are actually leaving churches that are designed for hype and excitement and beginning to look for the traditional classical church that is just teaching the word of God as it is. And that really gripped my heart. And I began to realize because many of them are grown up in an environment whereby they know they are hearing something, but when they go to the Bible, they begin to see there's a difference, there's a discrepancy 
between what the Bible really says and what people are being taught. And so we need to, uh, to ensure that we don't fall into that kind of a problem. And that's the reason why we would want to ensure that we understand the reason the Apostle Paul was saying these things. So then we looked at the motivators for another gospel. Why does it motivate the enemy using people who are uh, just deceived and others who are really sincere but sincerely wrong because of ignorance to bring to us another gospel and we saw that there are about six reasons actually not six but two reasons one we saw the nature of the gospel simply makes it possible for people to change the gospel the way the gospel is designed it makes our human nature want to change it and the reason we said is because the gospel is a stumbling block to the Jew and also an offense to the Greek. The way the gospel is designed is that it is actually stumbles the Jew who is a personification of a religious person and also offends the Greek who is the personification of an intellectual. And this is the reason. The Jews required signs they wanted signs. And I told you before that a Jewish person growing up had many stories about the signs and the miracles that God did. How God miraculously, you know, uh, he appeared before Moses in the bush that was not burning. That's a miracle. That's a sign. How, you know, Moses went before Pharaoh and he was holding a, a rod and when he dropped it, it turned to a snake. And when he picked it, it became, you know, a stick. And how, you know, ten plagues, you know, frogs and the river turning into blood and nuts and all these kind of things. And many, many, many miracles. The crossing of the, of the Red Sea and the parting of the sea. And then, you know, they are moving and by night there's a pillar of fire and during the day there's a cloud loud, you know, and, 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 you know, a Jewish child growing up, you know, hearing, you know, the miracles and how great God is, and they come to a place where by now Jesus comes and he is not really the miraculous one they are looking for. And so the gospel becomes very stumbling to a religious mind that has been cultured in a particular religious way. And so because of that, then that becomes a problem when the gospel comes and it's not miraculous as someone would want to see it, then they will want to find a way of circumventing. So it stumbles that particular kind of a Jewish mind and Jewish conditioning. Now, on the other hand, we say that, you know, the gospel is an offense to the Greek intellectual. Why? Because these, you know, Greeks, they demanded wisdom, including learning and wisdom, mental capacity and knowledge. And so when you simplify something that, you know, you don't need to explain many things to become a Christian, then this doesn't work well. So it becomes offensive. And so for that reason, the, the Greeks would rather have their own philosophers than the fools and the carpenter, you know, who just came along with a, a group of fishermen that didn't seem to have a lot of logic in the way they were doing things. And so because of that, then you find that this gospel, because of its nature, it becomes stumbling to several things. And that's what we looked at last time. So the gospel of the kingdom is a stumbling block, first of all, to human pride. It stumbles our human pride. Because what happens is when the gospel comes, it demands humility and self-surrender. You cannot receive the gospel unless you are humble and self-surrendered. And that is difficult for the human you know, pride. Human beings naturally will not just submit to something. You know, it requires a lot of uh, pleading, a lot of, um, you know, persuasion for us even to be submitted to obvious things. That's why, you know, you find when there's law, we have to be forced to abide by the law. When there are structures, sometimes we have to be reminded there has to be some consequences of not, you know, submitting because naturally human pride does not allow us to submit. So one of the ways in which the nature of the gospel becomes stumbling is when it confronts our pride and we are not able to be humble and self-surrendered. So I want you to see why. Then it will motivate anyone that wants to please masses to circumvent the issue of teaching humility and self-surrender. 
It is very difficult to find places nowadays where people are being taught humility. In fact, when you look at the many things that people are taught nowadays, we are really encouraged to really, you know, stand up and be ourselves and stand to be counted, you know, stand up, square your shoulders, walk tall, and, you know, and, and that's fine. But really, we need to balance that because what are we, you know, squaring our shoulders for? What are we standing for? Because you find then people become so proud that no one wants to submit to the other. No wonder we have so much problem in the world today. Even governing the world is becoming a problem because pride is becoming a major issue. Because where people are required to surrender and submit, they do not want to do that. Everybody wants to be on top. Everybody wants to do what they want to do. And then we saw, secondly, that the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ is a stumbling block to human righteousness. Human righteousness. There's something called self-righteousness. And this is because it demands repentance. When the gospel is presented to people, they are supposed to be repentant. You know how we don't like repenting? We don't. Even... <laughs> When we are praying and the leader of the prayer says we repent, you notice even our volume of prayer reduces. Because naturally human beings are self-righteous. We don't like repenting. If a man is arrested stealing, and the exhibit is playing in sight, and they are charged with the offense. Even lawyers advise you to plead not guilty. <laughs> That's human nature. <laughs> in insurance dealings, if you knock somebody's car, you know you have knocked it. Your insurance tells you do not admit liability. It's a human problem. <laughs> Although it is now translated into business. But sincerely, you know very well, everybody sees the CCTV cameras show you knocked that car. So even if you say no, you still be proven. But anyway, that's a law. But sincerely, from the perspective of God, the gospel becomes difficult when it is presented to the fallen human nature because it really comes right up against our human righteousness because it demands that we repent and we don't want to do that. We want to show God how good we are. The gospel is also a stumbling block to human wisdom. Human wisdom. Why? Because when we are confronted with the gospel, it demands us to become fools. Now, let me read scripture so that again, this doesn't become confusing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 to 20, the Bible says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he may become wise. Okay? Verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. The Bible says in the message version, don't fool yourself. Don't think that you can be wise merely by being up to date with the times. Okay? Be God's fool. <laughs> that is the path to true wisdom. What the world calls smart, God calls stupid. It is written in scripture, he exposes the chickenery of the chick. <laughs> Verse 20. <laughs> the master sees through the smoke screens of the know it horse. The other thing that is a stumbling block, or rather is stumbled by the gospel, is human ambition. Human ambition. And this is because when the gospel confronts us, it demands that we give service to the least. 
and the lowest. Human ambition comes and wants to destroy everybody so that it gets ahead. That's why in our country today you find there are people who are billionaires, but they don't even hesitate taking away property from a peasant using crafty means. How do you explain that? You hear companies that are making billions every year, they simply release effluent into water systems that are relied upon by masses. And nobody thinks about that. That's human ambition because it wants to get ahead at the expense of everybody else. Our human ambition must be tampered with contentment and godliness. Whenever your ambitions are tampered with godliness and contentment, or contentment and godliness, then what happens is you will evaluate your options with the heart of God. That you will not take advantage of somebody simply because you want to get ahead. You will sometimes treat the least very well because you care about them. Why? Because your heart is being born again. Your heart is sorted out by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Human social status. You all know <laughs> that when we come to God, the gospel only sees two people. A sinner and a saint. The gospel has no classifications. We don't have upper class sinners. Neither do we have upper middle class sinners, nor do we have low class sinners. When we come to the gospel, the gospel has only two people, a sinner and a saint. Let me tell you something. If it was in the power of people who determine social class, I would tell you there would be different levels of sinners. That's why wherever you go where human systems are, you find their differences. If you go to the airport, for example, you are flying. <laughs> there are people standing there, they tell you, <laughs> gold card holders, please go to the extreme left. And you notice that queue has fewer people. They even take your bags before you reach there. But you, if you have another funny card, even if you have 10 bags you, and two children, you will struggle with your problems. Then after that, they go to another place. When they board the plane, you don't know. When they disembark, you don't know. <laughs> you come to the plane, you are boarding, you find there are some empty seats there, depending on the plane. But other planes where, you know, they even move, after you board, they move the, they move the door so that you don't see them. And yet you're in the same plane. Human social status. The gospel tells us that when we believe in Jesus, we come to the same church, we sing the same songs, we eat the same Holy Communion. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even if we buy the bread from Kawangware and you buy your bread in City Square, you will take the same bread in the Lord's table. That is stumbling. You will have to be very humble to receive a gospel that brings you to a church like this, you sit with everybody and sing the same songs and call somebody my brother, my sister. That is why it's amazing how even with the straightforwardness of the gospel, we still have problems in the world today where people cannot mix in church. I've told you before, and I'll say it again, that the 10 o'clock hour in especially United States and some Western countries, is the most segregated hour because people who are friends during the week on Sunday, some go to this church and others go to that church. A friend of mine told me how he went to church in America one time. There was a church nearby where he was staying. So he walked there. So when he got there, he found some white ashes at the door. And they said, sir, we think you're mistaken. The church you're looking for is down the street because he was black. I know you're laughing, but it is true. I've been invited in churches where there are black people around, but there's only no one else who is black except me that is preaching. You feel funny. You feel like a black bean. 
in a bag of white beans. <laughs> Just feels strange. But that's how the world looks. And if the church is not careful, we simply fall into the same problems that the Apostle Paul was trying to address. And then the final thing that the nature of the gospel stumbles, human aspect is all kinds of selfishness, all kinds and forms of selfishness. Why? Because the first law of the gospel is self-denial. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Today, we have a gospel that really pampers selfishness. Getting all we can get and can all that we get. Doing everything to get as much as you can and not talking enough about sharing and giving to other people. We need to beware, friends, that the deceptiveness of the gospel is not just cultism. We have so many well-meaning believers today who have embraced another gospel. And they are okay. They pray the same God. They, they don't have funny behavior. But clearly, they have embraced a totally different gospel. And the church is getting weaker and weaker because of this kind of behavior. And so you find we no longer are influential. And that's what makes us not make the name of God attractive. And for that reason, many people are not attracted to Jesus and the one that we preach. So any teaching that takes away these stumbling blocks is a perversion of the gospel. So anyone that would want to remove or rather encourage selfishness, you know, amplify social status within the church of Jesus, you know, foster human ambition and feed it with all kind of gluttonous greed, that kind of a gospel becomes problematic and it won't be the kind of gospel that we've been called to espouse. And my prayer for us today, friends, is that this message helps us build what we call internal checks and balances within ourselves so that whenever you hear a message that seeks to circumvent any of these aspects that we have heard today, then there should be a red alert in your heart. You just know this gospel has a problem. And this is what the Apostle Paul warned us against. And when we become like this, we are able to know because we are going to hear these things. There is all, you know, there is preaching all over the place. You now know that everybody is a preacher on Facebook. You just need to open your Facebook and you will have someone who is uh, hosting a watch party. And we have very many preachers. <laughs> it is very easy to just hear some guy with some wonderful stuff, but you must evaluate that on the basis of the word of God. And if you are not well taught, of the word. You start following someone who will mislead you, and before you know it, you are perverted. Like the Apostle Paul said, that this is a perversion of the gospel, and it messes up the end game of the kingdom. You find that if we receive the wrong gospel, then it's not possible for God to rule and reign in our hearts, and then the kingdom of God is frustrated. And so, even if we pray, Your kingdom come and the means through which the kingdom is coming has been frustrated, then we will not experience that kind of thing. And I pray that God will help us to be able to avoid that and stand firm in his presence. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for your word. We thank you for the gospel that you gave us. And we realize, Lord, that this gospel is a stumbling block to the religious Jew, as well as an offense to the intellectual Greek. Lord, help us and teach us again so that we can come to the place whereby we deal with our human pride so that we are humble and self-surrendered. Help us, Lord, to shed of human righteousness and so that we can be repented when you call us to the place of repentance. Lord, help us to substitute our human wisdom with your wisdom by becoming fools in your presence. 
I pray that our human ambitions will be tampered with contentment and godliness because the Bible says that is great gain. Lord, I pray that our human social status will not get in the way because you have put us all on the same level, that there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no Gentile. And there is no male, there is no female, there is no free, there is no slave because you brought us to the same level in the gospel. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us to deal with all forms of human selfishness that deal with the problem that we are not able to be self-denied, that we want everything for ourselves at the expense of everybody. Lord, build us strong as a church, that as we prepare and as we build our capacity as a sitting church, we can also become a strong sending church that is built on the solid foundation of your word. King of glory, I thank you for every believer that walked into this service today. Father, we open our hearts to you and we pray that in Jesus' name, your glory will be manifested in the lives of your people. As we open our hearts to worship you today, we just honor you because your hand is stretched upon us that you see us at our personal levels. You know our needs, King of glory. You know the things that ail us. You know the issues that frustrate our lives. King of glory, we trust you today. And we thank you that the Bible says that they that call upon the name of the Lord shall never be disappointed. And so today, we have called upon your name. We sang your songs. We sang praises to you and we prayed. And so, Lord, I pray that you intervene in our situations in the name of Jesus. Father, there are people in this service who have personal needs. We raise those needs before you. In the name of Jesus, I pray that King of glory, by the power of the Spirit, you will stretch your hand and minister to every need in the name of Jesus. We pray that you heal the sick in Jesus' name. Every sickness, every disease, we command you to respond to the word of God that says by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. And so, Lord, every sickness and every disease right now, we address it by the authority of the name of Jesus, by the power in the blood of Jesus. Respond to the word of God that says by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. Every pain, every complication, every systemic failure of organs and body systems, we address it right now by the power of the name of Jesus. Be healed in Jesus' name. Respond to the word of God. Father, I pray for financial situations. There are people that are seated here today, Lord. They are confused. They don't know what is going to happen. They have tried every human intervention. Lord, I pray that you grant them wisdom, that finances will be released. As the children are going back to school, I pray that, Lord God Almighty, you will release your people into financial prosperity and provision in Jesus' mighty name. Those who have done businesses, and Father, their money is held unfairly. Lord, I pray that you unshackle whatever resources that are held for your people in the name of Jesus. I command miracles to be released in the lives of your people in the name of Jesus. Father, there are people here that require divine connections and favor. Doors opening for their sake. I release that as well upon the lives of your people in the name of Jesus. Lord, I decree that those who are op uh, opposed by demonic forces and ungodly people I declare that no weapon that is formed against your people shall prosper. Any wickedness directed against your people, I cancel it today in the name of Jesus. I pronounce your people blessed today. I prophesy breakthroughs in the mighty name of Jesus. I speak favor, Lord, that your people walk in the provision and the blessings of God. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. We worship you in the beauty of your holiness. I want us to stand up and just spend a few minutes as we worship this King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, just raise your voice. Begin to worship God. Begin to honor Him today in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, lift up your voices, church. We are in a mood of prayer. We are just waiting upon God. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. The order of our services is as follows. 
from 9 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., we have the intercessory prayers. And from 9.30 a.m., we have the main service, which runs concurrently with the teens and children's church. You are all welcome.